Hi, good morning, Adrian. Thank you for the introduction. Indeed, uh, we are back from our, I would say, coffee break, but it was actually a stretching, uh, stretching break. For the ones that just joined, we are, we are uh, continuing with, with the second session of our uh, ATIP Wind workshop on making Europe's power grid fit for climate neutrality. And this session is about enabling technologies. Uh, I, I am Vasiliki Klonari. I'm a senior analyst at Wind Europe in system integration and digitalization. And I'm here today with Suzanne Nis, board chair at Current. I'm not sure if Suzanne is already here. Hello, <laughs> Suzanne. Uh, William Winter, lead ele electrical system design for Tenet ESO. Hello. Nicolaus Kutululis, professor at uh, the technical, uh, Danish Technical University uh, in the Wind Energy Department. Hello. Owen Hodge, Chief Technology Officer at Supernode. Hi, Owen. And Frank Martin, Advisory uh, Engineer at Siemens Gamesa. Hi. So we, we are already, uh, hi everyone, we are already uh, a bit uh, uh, delayed with time. So we before we start, I will just uh, just want to remind some instruction, instructions for your participations. So please keep your cameras off and the micros off, but do use the chat since the beginning of the sessions to, to, to share your questions and to vote for questions by other participants, uh, because we we will not have time to discuss these questions after the presentations, uh, but we will have a panel discussion at the end. So I will be uh, checking uh, what you have already uh, shared. Let's start with the first presentation by Suzanne. Uh, as I said, Suzanne Nies is a general manager uh, Germany for uh, smart wires, silicon based power flow optimization um, company but also board chair of current association of uh, grid enhancing technology companies and she will give a presentation about the uh, nova principle and and why it should be we should deploy it right away so the floor is yours Suzanne. you're muted Thanks a lot, Vasiliki, and thanks uh, for having current today in this meeting. Uh, several of our members are also members of Wind Europe, uh, and we are deeply impressed by uh, the work that Wind Europe is doing also here in this ATIP platform. So the statement that I will uh, deliver here, and I will try to get uh, the timing back on track, uh, is enabling technologies to deliver climate neutrality NOVA now. NOVA is a principle that is introduced in Germany, also in Austria, in uh, Switzerland, in the so-called DACH uh, countries, and it means optimization ahead of reinforcement, ahead of expansion. The power networks, I want to be very clear here as well, uh, it is not alternative to have optimization instead of more networks. We need a lot of more networks as well, but optimization can deliver quite a lot and can deliver quite a lot in the future grids, in the reinforced grids and in the present grids. So the mantra of current uh, a newly founded New Kids on the Block Association since last year that I'm the board chair of, my vice board chair is also uh, sitting uh, Christian Kier, who was leading the first uh, winter association in Brussels, proud uh, that he's my, my vice, uh, working for Supernode. So the vision of current is a European power network that is the recognized world leader in enabling decarbonization through the efficient use of modern grid technology. And when you look at uh, what stakeholders are saying, I'm just quoting here Tom Burke, who is uh, the chair of E3G, a very well-known think tank in uh, BBC in June. What he was saying there is clearly that we need to use what we have on the shelf. I see very often in the discussion on innovation, it's kind of seen in a silo. Innovation is nice to talk about, it's for tomorrow and not for now. But that's why we are saying NOVA now use what we have. The climate change in its speed doesn't give us the luxury to wait any longer. And when you look at reports that have been released on the topic of 
optimizing the power networks. Just want to mention those here. One is uh, the one that current has delivered on uh, the need for grid optimization last year when we got set up. The second one is Ecoris that the Commission has commissioned last uh, two years ago now to the infrastructure forum and where it's all about why the current regulatory setting is not delivering the optimized energy system. CAPEX heavy, not learning from the experience of others are important elements to mention here. Uh, Wind Europe making the most of Europe's grid as we have so much curtailment only in Germany. We are talking about 2 billion euro year by year uh, that are going into redispatch and curtailment. Uh, just now, the, the uh, Ministry for Energy and in, uh, Economics in Germany, uh, BMWE, has published the Betriebsmittelstudie operational devices and lists a lot of things. And Ensory, my former employer, has done a great job in gathering uh, in the Technopedia technologies, deployments and applications of those. Why is that not used? Finally, our partner association, What in the US, has uh, commissioned a report to Brettel and uh, is there uh, presenting the combined benefit of grid enhancing technologies, dynamic line rating, superconductors and PETS devices. Um, why are we not using those things is a very important question I would like to ask here. Um, next slide. Um, sorry, I just want to give one example here on uh, my own company, SmartWire. SmartWire is 10 years old, a teenager company from the Silicon Valley. This is National Grid. That in this year is not doing a pilot, is not going for innovation, but just doing it, is deploying 48 smart valve uh, in the national grid system. Uh, national grid system is characterized by huge wind generation in the north and a lot of consumption in the south, Scotland to London area. And now with the opportunity of using those power electronics that smart valve are, you can uh, save to the customer 387 million pounds. And that's not something that we as smart wires are saying. This is what the regulator of Jam is saying. You see here some pictures of the deployments and we are looking forward to see this replicated in other areas. Um, so just briefly also to mention again this Brattle report. Uh, when you look at the, the outcome of this uh, Brattle report, we see a huge benefit uh, that uh, is uh, assessed here in the US case in a couple of uh, countries of the US, uh, member states of the United States uh, that are uh, combined here. And we will come out with uh, Christoph Maurer's Consentech with a similar study uh, looking at 2030, looking at the so-called core region in Europe. We want to present it to the infrastructure forum and showing here the combined benefits of intelligent power grid design tools. Um, to conclude, uh, what is the recommendation that current has for NOVA now? First of all, it's extremely important that long-term European targets and also the regulation are much better aligned. I think we are seeing a lot of promising things happening there, 10E, TYNDP revamped, etc. but there needs to be even more ambition. My own country has seen its constitutional court uh, telling the government that we were not on track with the implementation of the climate law. Um, we need to accelerate near-term investment that future-proof future and strengthen the resilience of power grids. Just elections in Germany, and you look where parties are, they talk about infrastructure funds, and we see similar things happening in the US, in other parts of the world. Infrastructure spending, smart infrastructure spending for this long-term investment, 40 plus years, is definitely needed here. We need to optimize power networks, the existing and the new ones, and build new ones when they are needed. SCBA, a social cost benefit analysis, needs to be looking at power network investments. Transparency is always key for what everyone does in network development. The huge role with electrification from 20 to 60% that 
goes to the TSOs and also in the future to the DSOs requires from them to go for transparency in all these processes on development and operations. And then in the regulation, the most important here is output based regulation, a regulatory approach when you do um, tendering. You need to go for output based and not saying that this needs to be more CAPEX. TSOs tell me all over the place that this CAPEX heavy approach is not helping them to go for new solutions. And then finally, develop a structured, transparent and collaborative approach to qualification of innovative solutions. It is culture, it's mentality that drives change. It's all about people. I'm happy to see that in many TSOs and in many DSOs, as well as in the Commission, as well as in associations like WIND, there is already this mentality, but we need more supporters for that. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Suzanne, for uh, explaining these very important points. Uh, we continue with uh, William Winter, uh, who is a lead electrical system design at Tenet. He is leading Tenet's expert in 4HVDC and connection codes. He was a convener of the NSOE drafting team of the HVDC network code, and in the past he has always also worked for Siemens in system planning. So uh, Willem uh, will give a, a vision of the future uh, hybrid ACDC system that can enable climate neutrality. So the floor is yours, Willem. Yes, thank you, Vasiliki, and thank you very much for um, uh, inviting us uh, to this very important workshop, making Europe's power grid fit for um, climate neutrality. Can you switch on the slides or how does it work? Yes, if you ideally you, you can uh, um, uh, use your own. OK, slides. then I will use my own slides. Mm -hmm. Sorry. It's OK. Um. Okay, thank you for inviting uh, us to this to this important workshop here. And um, it was already said that it's very important to further develop uh, the the European power system. Um, enabling it to deliver the climate neutrality. And most important part is also to go into the offshore section. Yeah, so as it was uh, already said also by Daniel, but also from Joachim, that this is the most challenging uh, uh, part we have uh, to, 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 to achieve in, an, in, a, in a very short time. Um, so, what is needed to go into this as it was said already that it's very uh, that is uh, at uh, at the moment we have more radial connections offshore and uh, the the hdc uh, connections we have are more or less interconnectors or connection to offshore or there are also some embedded hdc plant so it's really important for going forward to uh, to this um target and also to these goals we have to to come to more let's say efficient and more um, uh, innovative solutions on HVDC that means going into multi-terminal solutions make these solutions extendable and this is a prerequisite to break the ice yeah, for developing the offshore grids so the first point is that we have to unlock the first of its kind multi-terminal multi-vendor system by developing and testing the full industrial control and protection system for extendable HVDC systems and also to indicate a proper financing framework to provide the sufficient due risk and innovative for full-scale multi-vendor HVDC system demonstration. So it is very much appreciated the efforts of the three associations uh, and to e uh, t in the europe and windrope to to elaborate it and also to send out and provide it and publish the report there was also an important workshop in june this year on this multi vendor uh, multi terminal hvdc uh, development and uh, we have to follow this approach uh, in order to achieve all these goals we have in mind 
On the other side, we have to keep the system stable. So stability management is a very important part. What we observed already is that there are more and more HVD systems and power electronics installed, of course, of course. And we saw also in the presentations from IEA, but also from Daniel, uh, that uh, it is expects up to 2050 that we have 80, 90%. Yeah? So it's really urgent yeah, to deal with that, how to make the system stable, how to keep the system stable for all the stability issues like resonance stability, converter-driven stability, rotor angle stability, voltage and frequency stability. So low inertia um, is also a topic, the rate of change of frequency, um, the system splits. Yeah? All this we have to cover, and also the question is how a hybrid uh, ACD system can support, let's say, the, 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 the goals we have. And the question is, what are the mitigation measures for that? What is the right solution to go ahead on that? So we all know grid forming control is, is already present. It was developed. There is a migrate study on that. There are also national studies on that. But it's not deployed so far, huh? so maybe it's under under uh, consideration to require it in a broader view. But it's very important to go further also on the system management itself. Yeah, um, having the capability already of grid forming control um, to bring the entire system forward on that. Then, if we have this, then we have also to check. And I'm coming back to the large offshore grids. What, how can we develop the further DC system? Yeah? So it's more or less clear that without um, HVDC or DC systems, um, the evocation of all this offshore wind energy will not work. We have to change from radial to more multi-terminal solutions and HVDC grids. And for that, a lot of um, assessments are needed. For example, to assess the most suitable HVDC grid architecture. What is the right level of selectivity as we have it in the AC grids? What is the right level of um, redundancy, topological redundancy, operational redundancy, like we have it in the AC grid? To assess the system reliability and resilience of the hybrid AC system to contribute to increase the TIL of new HVDC components where necessary and achieve market readiness. That's very important to achieve the market readiness also for the DC breakers, yeah? to unlock, let's say, um, the, the DC grids, yeah? then use HVDC technology as a firewall blocking the spread of disturbances. Yeah? and master the these HVDC technologies to enable a new business horizons for European companies, finally achieve climate neutrality of the electricity generation sector, allowing the integration of large scale share of renewables. Yeah. So that are the three parts we have to go further. The first step is to unlock towards the future widespread hybrid HVD systems to, to open for the first European, uh, first of its kind multi-vendor project to provide an adequate environment for relevant research and innovation actions for developing multi-vendor, multi-terminal HVDC grids and stable hybrid ACDC systems to enable the knowledge sharing and expandability of backbone widespread HVDC grid across various countries and make the DC grids as easy as AC grids. Yeah? That means connecting generation and demand at the DC connection point in the long term. Yeah? Um, that we have a connection point at the DC system and is a free market to connect and derive recommendations for developing or recommending also connection network codes, but also other co codes like uh, ESO guideline, system operational codes, whatever. So. Thank you very much for listening, and I'm open for questions later on. Thank you very much, Willem, for first of all, for setting this vision, uh, but also for uh, highlighting very specific priorities that we should be working on together uh, in the next years. 
And now let's continue with uh, uh, Nico Kutululis. Uh, he's a professor at the Danish Technical University in the Wind Energy Department. And his research is focusing on the system integration of wind power, speci more specifically on, on uh, variability and uncertainty issues, control functionalities and ancillary services. And, and the la these last years, mostly on the offshore side and interactions with HVDC transmission. And uh, so he will give a presentation about uh, wind turbine and wind power plant control controls. Thank you very much, Vasiliki. And uh, let me join the, the, the core and say thank you very much for this uh, very nice uh, workshop and this opportunity to discuss uh, and share the floor with uh, with uh, such a select company of experts and discuss how to uh, how to move to decarbonized or climate neutral uh, power systems. And uh, we already heard in this session we heard a bit before, but also in this session we we talked a bit about uh, technologies that are already here and we should use what Susanne said, but also William talking about what should be the next steps on developing the the grid. I come from academia, so I thought uh, I should probably not say too much about specific technology. We have so many industrial representatives that we can do that better than me, but I wanted to, to bring a bit into perspective what this development means uh, also in terms of uh, control from uh, from wind power plants. So I will actually focus a bit on, on, on wind uh, in my uh, in my short uh, presentation. So uh, um, if I manage to move my slides, yes. When we talk about the decarbonization of the power grid, one way is to see it uh, as energy mixes and contributions of the energy production from the different sources. But uh, the way I look at it, sometimes it's uh, it's as you see in the figure where we see uh, some of the systems, which it's called here past, but it's not really past in many countries. It's pretty much uh, still uh, uh, still valid today, where we have uh, all this uh, uh, standard um, old AC. A type of power system with uh, very centralized big uh, power plants and then you have the distribution to the to the consumers what we are going are at least uh, the the phase where some of the countries at least in europe are and others more other less but we are hopefully all of us moving towards this is uh, is hopefully to an image which looks more like the middle one the present where we still have uh, centralized power plants but we have more and more renewable generation and from this perspective and I think William touched a bit about it it's the fact that uh, we are moving from uh, from having synchronous generators connected to the system to uh, variable resources which are connected to power electronics so, uh, inverter based resources or, or, or whatever we want to uh, to call them it's uh, the terminology it's still uh, out for debate but we have more and more of these units and what I think we are uh, all of us uh, working towards is getting to a, to a system like the one on the right side where we will have uh, uh, very many uh, full, all of them or, or a very, very large number of the resources will be uh, inverter based and also uh, the consumption also is becoming uh, uh, connected to the to the system through through inverters. And uh, my, my thinking here was a bit what what does that mean? In terms of role and responsibilities for uh, for one of the generator, one of the main generators, uh, uh, hopefully in the system for wind power. And uh, uh, before we get to that, we should uh, maybe not forget that actually the role and responsibilities have increased significantly over time for wind power. And uh, an example that we uh, we use with uh, to show to our students is the uh, uh, FRT requirements through time. So the fault right through when we have a, a short circuit in the system. What, how wind power should uh, should in, should behave all that, or should uh, what would be the requirements and how should it behave doing that? And we can see that from the early 90s, where there was uh, uh, not really included in the recommendations for wind power, so wind power was not uh, considered as a, as an important asset for this. Uh, to, uh, to today, so uh, 20, a little more than uh, you know, two decades, three decades, we have moved from not being not considered important to have uh, required to have a very, very uh, active role and um, reactive current injection to avoid voltage collapse, but also how to, to ramp up the, the power after the fault is cleared and uh, going to very sophisticated and, and complex uh, uh, ways of controlling it, which to balance and detect asymmetrical faults in the system. So the requirements have increased a lot over time uh, in uh, that, are, that are placed up upon 
wind power plants. And uh, if we uh, if we think a bit about it and try to to maybe um, see it at the, as a conceptualized level, uh, we had the first generation of wind uh, of wind power plants or wind turbines. And when I say the first generation, I do talk about variable speed wind turbines. I leave the the fixed speed ones be behind, but when wind turbines start being connected or combined with power electronics, we had the first generation where they were uh, very much focused on maximum power point production. So they were uh, sources of, of uh, electricity productions and they were they had their ability of, of controlling their active and reactive power, but they did require to have energized and strong grids to be connected to so they can function properly. And they had minor really contribution to the system stability. If we look at the second generation, which is pretty much where we are today, I think we see that we still have uh, quite quite some focus on MPPT. So wind is one of the cheapest uh, energy um, generators in the in the world today, but uh, and maintained, of course, all the previous abilities. But now they were uh, their control was further developed to not only control the power, active and reactive power, but to do it in a way that will support the frequency and the voltage uh, grid. And of course, still needed energized grid and somehow stronger, I think, solutions for connecting to weaker grids were also developed. But their contribution to the system stability is, is, is increasing or has been increasing and they do contribute today to, to maybe a bit larger extent that is sometimes uh, seen and, and recognized. But what is maybe important for, for the discussion and the, the path that we are, we are moving now towards uh, decarbonization is the next generation, which I think uh, uh, Willem also talked a bit about, is this grid forming control. Um, maybe the capabilities are there at the, at the converter level. And maybe large HVDC converters can and will provide that in the European system, but also probably at some point, uh, if we keep in mind the previous uh, picture I showed you with the uh, with 100 per rest, percent rest or close to 100 percent rest systems when we get to that this will probably be required from uh, from other generators as well and wind power can be uh, one of it and uh, i think this will will, will actually mean uh, you know maybe maybe a fundamental change in the way they are controlled because we are moving more and more away from mppt maximum power point tracking um, uh, operation and we are going sort of an on demand production and by on demand I mean being able to follow the, the needs of the grid to form the grid and, and, and control what the grid needs and maybe less on, on, on what it can produce. And of course this is a very huge difference because uh, you will keep the, the other but you will, should be able to create the voltage and the, and the frequency in the system which means that it does not need energized and strong grid anymore but it actually creates that grid. And in that case of course the contribution to the system stability will be uh, will be major from uh, from wind power plants. So I think we are we are we are moving towards uh, the next generation of wind power plants that are will be uh, required to do things uh, at least from my perspective significantly different than than they are doing that uh, today. Uh, and uh, to stop here, what I wanted to say is that we actually. Wind turbines and plants are very performant generations with very high controllability. I think they have, uh, of course, they have the limitations given by the wind speed envelope and all that. But inside that envelope, they can be controlled uh, with very high accuracy and, and faster than uh, than uh, conventional uh, generators. And they can develop into into the backbone of the Europe's net zero power grid. But we should be careful that this is actually requiring. Uh, uh, changes both in technology. I don't think it's only software, it's only control, but will pretty much uh, also require some hardware changes and maybe combine them in hybrid power plants or, or moving them toward smaller or larger energy systems in themselves. But before we do that, I think we need to understand better the system needs and, the, and what are the technology boundaries. And not least, uh, try to understand that we are moving from being the, uh, you know, moving to add value to the system and that value should be quantified and recognized and uh, um, and re remunerated in a way, you know, credited for in a way uh, in the future. I think I'll stop here. Thank you, Nico. <laughs> Many thanks for uh, changing the phase angle, I can say, of our, of our session uh, and uh, talking about what uh, um, wind can do for, for grids. 
Um, we'll have also another presentation uh, at the end of the session about uh, our uh, responsibilities also by wind farms and you know what they can do more than just producing kilowatt hours in the future. The next speaker is Owen Hodge, he's chief uh, technology officer at Supernode, a company producing superconductor-based uh, technolo grid technologies, and he will give a presentation about uh, superconductors. Now the floor is yours, Soy. Okay, thanks Vasiliki. Yeah, very happy to be here. Um, so as you say, I'm from Supernode, and today I'm going to talk on how superconductors can deliver on carbon neutrality. So in Supernode, we're developing transformative superconducting transmission cables that will allow us harness the scale of renewables required to deliver on decarbonisation. We believe that our technology will be a key contributor in Europe's energy system, achieving carbon neutrality in the coming decades. So today I'll give you an overview as to what we're developing at Supernode and how our technology can be applied to address decarbonisation. So we see two main applications for our technology. The first of these is connection systems which can collect high capacities of offshore wind at medium voltages and transmit these to shore and beyond through terrestrial cables to industry and population centres. What we see in industry currently is that while the cost of renewables generation has fallen enormously, the proportional cost of connection has risen. Current HVDC platforms are large, they're expensive, um, granted they have reduced in size and cost, in the last re in the recent last recent times but they're still limited in capacity these are all issues that can be addressed in a system based on supernode superconducting cable technology where large power densities can be transmitted at medium voltage levels the second of our applications is for a wider superconducting grid that can span the continent we expect to see energy demand triple in a decarbonized system which again we saw presented by other so speakers this morning, with our energy sources moving from co-located fossil fuel based systems to one which is weather based with sources located at the continent's periphery. In a decarbonized energy system, we'll need to move enormous amounts of power over large distances and our current grids and our current grid technology simply can't do this. We need an efficient, high capacity and long distance transmission technology. So what I'm presenting here is a concept for an overlay grid that can be realized with Supernodes technology to balance power around the continent at, at different times of, of uh, high capacity availability and high demand at different locations around the continent. So just to present that in a typical scenario, so here we're looking at a typical winter's day uh, in a decarbonized Europe, where as we all know, we're likely to have high wind capacity around the North Sea and in the Atlantic area, and this needs to be transferred to Central and Southern Europe. So while we currently have some interconnectors around the continent, we've nothing on the scale required to allow us to operate an energy system that's largely based on renewable sources, where we need to move vast quantities of power around from the peripheries towards the centre. So superconductors for transmission, what is the state of the art? What's the value proposition? And what are Supernode developing to realize this? The good news is that superconducting cables and superconducting power transfer are already commercial technologies available at TRL9 in distribution applications. So shown here are two flagship projects. One is in Germany, in Essen in Germany, which has been operational as an energy asset since 2013. And the other is a project in Seoul and Korea, operational since 2019. Also of note is the Superlink project in Munich, uh, which represents a step change in power capacity, voltage level and distance. So we're stepping up to 110 kV system, 500 MVA and a 12 kilometer length of a superconducting cable under the city of Munich. Supernode are building on the maturity in these distribution technologies for high capacity, long distance and offshore applications. So what technology is Supernode developing with superconductors? So essentially we're developing transmission cables that leverage the properties of superconductors to maximize their potential for bulk power transfer. 
We're developing a system that can be used in a marine environment and will enable efficient connection of the large volumes of offshore wind required to decarbonize. Our two gigawatt system obtained a statement of feasibility from DNV last year and development work has progressed, progressed to proof of concept and further qualification since then. We're also developing high capacity, long distance terrestrial cable systems comprising a novel approach to cryostat design and a unique thermal and cryogen management system that will significantly reduce the capex and opex of bulk power transfer over long distances. So just to give you a comparison of how that might play out, um, what I'm showing here is a superconducting offshore connection system relative to a, a standard copper-based HVDC system. So here we see that at, at medium voltage transmission level for the superconducting system, the offshore platform can be much smaller and cheaper than that required for the copper-based approach. And this can be achieved through elimination of transformation and the reduction in size of the converter systems on the platform, which in the superconducting case can operate at anything from 50 to 150 kV quite comfortably, given the higher current densities that can be accommodated by the superconducting cable with no penalty in terms of transmission losses itself. And I guess a point to note here is that this, this type of benefit is also seen when we apply the technology to the terrestrial case. So significant cost savings and size savings in terms of substations, converter halls, uh, converter technology costs, and in leeways that are required for underground cable transmission. So the Supernode story. So Supernode is a young company. Um, we're young but ambitious. We were founded in 2019. And as I said, last year we achieved a statement of feasibility from DMVGL um, for our offshore cable concept, along with undertaking successful benchmark testing of our early generation cryostat systems. This year we've undertaken proof of concept testing on various subsystems and we will patent our key cryostat and thermal management innovations by the end of this year. So looking forward then, our medium term objective is to continue our qualification and deliver a TRL6 uh, system prototype by 2025 with pilot demonstrations to follow quickly afterwards. So in Supernode, we're also examining the integration of our cable systems with wind parks on the broader grid. So we've undertaken a project with Strathclyde University where we examined the responses and the behaviour of our cable, the wind park and the downstream network under various operating and transient fault conditions. We found very interesting benefits in terms of fault management, leveraging the characteristics of the superconducting cable. So we've published one paper now in, in the IEEE Transactions on Energy Conversions, which I can refer any interested parties to um, for further information. And we've numerous other papers that are currently under review and due to be published or released later on this year. So the second phase of this project with Strathclyde is ongoing, and we've looked, into broad, we've looked to broaden out the study uh, to examine integration and behaviour of our cables and the network in mesh configurations such as those shown on the screen. We started with the promotion project hub concept for a small mesh network and we're broadening this out to a representative mesh grid in the North Sea, landing power to both the UK grid and to those on the continent. Although this work is also ongoing, we're again seeing that system benefits can be accrued from leveraging the properties of the cables and superconductivity itself that facilitate inherent fault management and allow significant rerouting of power flows, providing re resilience to the grid as a whole. OK, so that brings my, my talk to an end. Uh, on screen here, I'm just showing some, some of the academic papers that we've published this year in the process of releasing and publishing in the coming months. So anyone can feel free to get in touch with me directly or to look these up themselves for further information. OK, thanks very much. Thank you, Owen, for uh, presenting this uh, very interesting emerging technology, the superconducting uh, grids. Let's continue with the last presentation uh, by Frank Martin. He's advisory engineer at Siemens Gamesa, focusing on uh, offshore grid compliance and, of course, its impact on the design of wind turbines. Frank, over to you. Yeah, I just try to. Can you see the presentation? Yes. Super. Yeah. 
thanks a lot, uh, Vasiliki. Also, uh, thanks for the possibility to present a few things um, you know, on behalf of Siemens Camisa here in this uh, workshop. I guess it's a pretty interesting topic. And then, yeah, we would like to present a bit the OEM point of view. Uh, sorry. Um, how does it work? Yeah, we were thinking a bit uh, if we should also say something about the technology like crit forming or so, but um, but step back a little bit and, um, and and try to put a few words on the challenges we see and the way forward and then to promote or not provoke the debate a bit or at least the exchange of ideas um, and so on. And uh, yeah, with the first thing we, we thought, I mean, where we are today, and I guess Daniel and, and other colleagues have already presented about this and and uh, and shown a lot of um, nice graphs and things. But I guess, uh, yeah, we, we just looked at these two pictures here and 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 can see where we are today around 2021 and and what way we, or what task we have ahead of us. And also from the, let's say, from the turbine size and and wind power plant size point of view i mean it will be probably a, a steep uh, climb the next uh, couple of years and uh, as daniel also said we are heading towards 14 15 16 megawatt turbines and uh, and let's say multi gigawatt uh, wind power plants just to to set the, the frame a little bit but what are current challenges um and the first thing, maybe uh, it's it's a thing which has been discussed for many, many years, are uh, actually the, let's say, the, the crit code requirements. And uh, in fact, over the last uh, 10 or 15 years, where also Wind Europe has a task force on this topic, we, we, we still discuss uh, definitions like unit, power park module, equipment. and. Uh, and that shows also that we are moving quite slow on this. Um, we also discuss other requirements uh, constantly, like what does it mean simulation model validation for for RMS and EMT models? How uh, rate of change of frequency is is defined? How is it measured? And 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 all these things. Um, and on the other side, we start with discussion on grid forming and new technologies, but we have not really finalized the let's say the basics. The second point is a bit where, as Daniel said, the, the wind power plant size is, is increasing and increasing. So now we talk about gigawatt uh, plants, but we have also certain connection points. So grid connection as such is getting more and more challenging and requires yeah, much more sophisticated tools, studies, and so forth. And uh, the third point I want to mention here is that the power system is changing also in the at the same time. I mean, converter based resources increase, less uh, synchronous machine, and that will have an impact on the, let's say, on the running fleet and, and will require more effort on this, which we already see today. Then, uh, yeah, we start um, using new controls. I mean, grid forming was mentioned uh, by Wilhelm and, and Nicolas. Um, so there will be new requirements uh, drafted. There will be uh, new capabilities needed, and uh, and uh, the power system impact is uh, yeah is is still discussed or under investigation. And then on the other side, yeah, the keyword digitalization comes also into 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 the game or into the power system, which of course uh, will bring more data, more flexibility. But I guess on the other side, it could also bring more vulnerability. So cybersecurity is a topic. And the, I mean, the, the main point we think a little bit is, um, does the industry um, work uh, sufficiently together to, I mean, to achieve these, uh, these huge targets or tasks we have ahead of us? So speaking about system operators, developers, I mean, us from the from the manufacturer side and, and maybe also the associations. So just a question mark, and maybe there could also be some comments in the chat on this topic. But um, but where do we see the, the future? No, my slideshow doesn't move. 
Um, I mean, in principle, we see uh, somehow two uh, two aspects for the for the power system. One is, of course, the let's say the power system to produce electricity, and uh, as mentioned already, there is there is some massive grid expansion needed in the future. And uh, what we should, of course, take into account that uh, climate change is, is already uh, happening. So, so we should make the power systems uh, resilient enough and uh, and also able to withstand such events in whatever way. I mean, storms uh, and other things. On the other side, we get much more users into the power system. So, I mean, we see much more electrical vehicles in Denmark. Um, domestic heating and and this electrification and as mentioned also the digitalization comes into every and every piece of equipment on the renewable side i mean especially wind but i guess also other renewables i think we uh, we need to acknowledge that uh, we uh, need to live up to the responsibility uh, yeah for the power system i mean in the 30 years ago at 20 kilowatt wind turbine was just sitting there and produced power. But today with uh, gigawatt wind power plants, there, there is a certain, I mean, there is quite a responsibility for the power system. And uh, and that is a learning I think the whole industry need to take and has taken already, but uh, it's probably not over yet. Um, we will also see more extensive uh, grid code requirements we believe i mean as mentioned grid forming is something which will will be, will be more advanced and um yeah and coming as a probably as a requirement in the in the next uh, revisions of, of of grid codes but also aspects like uh, compliance studies simulation models and and also new assessment methods for example hardware and the loop will be more important in the future. We, we, we believe, as, as we have also heard, we are not uh, building end-to-end uh, -end wind power plants offshore, but we try to interconnect them in the future. And there will be massive tasks on assessment studies needed. Um, on the grid compliance side, I think the days are over where, we, where a wind power plant was grid compliant at day one, but we, need to look in the for the whole lifetime or over the whole lifetime of a wind power plant so that means being grid compliant for 25 or 30 years um and the last point on this slide if it works yeah as also mentioned a bit before uh, the offshore grids getting more and more important and we will probably see uh, yeah, new grid connection schemes getting deployed and um, that is trends we already see in, in Germany, Netherlands, but I think that will will be more and more advanced in the future. And then the, the second pillar in, on the on the power system is probably the, the whole topic power to X, which is certainly not my main focus, but uh, points um, already mentioned uh, power to hydrogen as a kind of yeah area which which serves the, the shipping steel industry uh, ammonia was also mentioned as a as an as an area which which will be important and uh, yeah, my colleague mentioned also battery ships which is maybe a little bit further in the future but what i was thinking a bit how will all these things uh, being reflected in let's say in grid code requirements if we have energy islands we try to produce electricity and uh, and uh, hydrogen at the same time or have more high, uh, hybrid power plants. That will be also a challenge to reflect this in, in the requirements. And um, yeah, so there is a long way to go. And I think from uh, as a kind of conclusion point for us, it's it's probably the the interaction between the, the different parties, I mean, within the industry, that is probably one of the most crucial points to overcome and to achieve, I mean, the, the targets we, we have here ahead of us. It's not so much the technologies, I, we believe it's more that we really work together and uh, and, and try to move towards these, uh, these goals and ambitions. And that's from my side. Thanks a lot.
Thank you, Frank, for giving us the perspective of the of the wind turbine uh, manufacturers or for uh, the uh, transition to climate neutrality. We already have uh, we are already over time, so we I will just take one the question that is in the chat, and I think the question was for. Uh, Willem, uh, so the comment is uh, about the importance of innovation and how it shouldn't be uh, just a nice to have happening in parallel, but really enabling all these developments. And the, so the question to you would be, what what do you see as you know the the, the most the major um, research actions, the most important ones that should be happening uh, in the next years uh, with regard to grid to grid. So thank you, Vasiliki, for this question. I think the most important one, and I said it already in my presentation, is to 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 go further to HVDC grip. What is really needed, yeah, to to unlock this, yeah, to to start HVDC grid to go into the market, to bring to 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 make extendable HVDC systems, yeah. Even if there is a day one for for the first, um, let's say, HVDC part. And then some years later, um, maybe the the extension to to a more widespread HVDC grid, and this should should work, yeah. And this should be unlocked that uh, that we have the standards available, that all the vendors are able to connect to such a DC grid in the first step, but then also others, yeah. So to open this, yeah, this DC grid as we have it. At the AC side that you can connect without having tuning of other connections. Yeah. So what, what we heard from Gamesa, for example, what are the capabilities? If the capabilities are are, are are given, yeah, then you can connect to an AC grid, yeah, without having a lot of tuning, yeah, with, with other connections. Yeah. And this is also needed for the DC grid. Otherwise, I think we cannot. Uh, achieve the goals in time. Uh, this is the most important innovation we have. And the report from the three asso associations and to e, uh, T and the European Wind Europe shows this already. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's uh, a good message for uh, for closing the session. Continue our, our common work. Just to let you know that I will uh, post uh, questions in the chat for the rest of the speakers, and uh, because we don't have time uh, for oral discussion, and um, that we will now have a break. Uh, let's make a break of three minutes, Daniel. I, I hope this is okay for you. So Daniel Freile will continue with the last session about how to deploy these technologies uh, and uh, yeah he will moderate the session so enjoy your very short break and thank you for uh, your participation thanks Lord. Thanks.